I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 50 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 050. Now, we do have a gun of the show for this episode, like normal. This time, it's the Kiapa Puma 1911-22. I originally purchased this one because it seemed interesting. To make it perfectly clear, this thing is made from an aluminum alloy that uh, Kiapa calls Kiapa alloy or something like that. They combine Kiapa and alloy together with the A being shared, if I'm not mistaken. However, the alloy feels a lot like pot metal and it is a very lightweight material. The grips on mine are plastic, even though they advertise that now they're wood. And I'm going to go out and say it. The trigger pull is horrible. Now, this thing does look like a 1911. It kind of feels like a 1911, and it shoots well when you get past the bad trigger pull. The grips can be replaced with some, but not all 1911 grips, depending on how they're shaped. It's been a few years since I tried putting different grips on the thing, so, you know, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the uh, grip, what grips, uh, and what about the grips were keeping them from being a compatible grip. But I want to say it's how big the back of the grip is. Now, internally, this thing has about as much in common with a 1911 as a 1911 has with a SIG P220 double action only. And should you decide to field strip it, I would suggest you be very careful while doing so, and you make sure you know where everything goes when you try to put it back together. If not, you'll be figuring it out for quite a while. For the money you would use to buy this, you could probably pick up a used Ruger 2245, depending on where you get it from, but you would not have the look of a 1911. Now, with that said, let me give you some specifications, and we'll go on from there. The model number for this one is CF401-043. It is chambered in 22 long rifle, has a capacity of 10 plus 1. It is a single action trigger, but it is a horrible trigger pull. The sights on it are GI style 1911 style sights. The rear is drift adjustable. The alloy, or the materials on this thing, it does use an alloy frame and slide the barrels made out of steel and the grips on mine are polymer or plastic depending on what you want to call them however the newer models do have wood grips it weighs in at 2.1 pounds and i could not find an msrp in the short time i had to pull up the gun of the show for this episode however the street price at the time i'm recording this is anywhere from two to three hundred bucks and with that said i want to run a little bit of an audio clip so you can uh tell how to get the show if you're getting it through some abnormal channel and you don't know where it came from after that i'll be right back and we'll cover some more of the shows well some more content on the show the gun rights in texas podcast is available on itunes on stitcher on myro player youtube the website and of course in your favorite app using the rss feed on the website With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. And we're back with, uh, well, we actually got some email from listeners that I want to go over. Lucy and Dave wrote in with a news item that I will credit them with at the end of the show. Other than that, well, they're going to get pushed back to the end of the show, so we're not going to cover their email any further than this. Now, Bill wrote in, hmm... Well, let's just say Bill wrote in with some comments about the show, and we cannot repeat them. I'm going through my email as I do this, so don't be don't get don't get your hopes up for a you know for a lot of stuff to get read. Jack, okay, Jack wrote that we can read his email on the podcast. Jack wrote in saying, "I have carried a gun legally for over 50 years. I have not spent all that time in Texas." However, when I moved to Texas, I already had an already had a concealed carry license from another state, non-resident. That well, uh, okay, I'm I'm uh, I'm getting different lines mixed up. My monitor's too far away for me to read the fine print that I've got it set at. Okay, I have legally carried uh, for 50 years. When I moved to Texas, I did so with a non-resident license from another state that Texas recognized. I have been in the military for. And I have no idea what that is. I don't know if it's uh, supposed to be 10 years, 20 years, or 120. I don't think it's supposed to be 120, though. I think he has a typo there. He was going to hit one key, and he hit two. So, or he's going to hit one or two, and he hit both. Anyways, he goes on to say, 
that C.J. Grisham has posted that he carries regularly. Yeah, I know. And that he does so with a license that he got because he was in the military from another state. Or he was in the military and lived in another state. Okay, I see where he's going with this. Anyways, Bill is saying that C.J. Grisham could not get that license if he was from, if he did not already have it when he moved to Texas. And even then, if it's a resident license, it's invalid because apparently he he says C.J.'s, you know, everybody knows C.J.'s uh, retired from the military now. But he's pointing out that when C.J. retired, Texas became his state of residence since he retired there. I'm not entirely 100% sure how that works, but, you know, that makes sense to me. But he goes on, he, he lists a whole bunch of things that, uh, well, he lists a whole bunch of things that explain his position and I'm not going to read over them. I probably won't include the email in the show notes because, well, I need to do some more research on it. In fact, I probably, I probably wouldn't have read the email if I had, I probably wouldn't have included the email on this show if I had read it simply because I don't like, I don't like putting facts out there without researching them first. Anyhow, I'm going to skip the rest of the email so I don't mess up again. And we're going to move on to a little bit of a, um, you know, it's a news announcement for the show. I have been working on a website redesign. It's pretty much live. There's a few little things that get, that are going to get added. One of the things is going to be a listen page. And on that listen page is going to be a streaming audio service. For the most part, right now, the streaming audio is strictly for the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. But, yep, there's a but there. But the streaming audio is going to be included for live podcasting when we do live sessions in the future, like the one I'm planning for April 2nd. Well, the thing I like about the live audio and the streaming audio is that it may not be just for the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Right now, you can find the live streaming service on the uh, live page, gunrightsintexas.com slash live, L-I-V-E. But in the future, it'll be on the listen page when I get that up. And the listen page will tell you how to get the show and everywhere you can get it, kind of like our little uh, audio promo I just ran a moment ago. Now, like I said, this may not be limited just to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. I may open it up to some other podcast. Until then... It's only going to have me, my voice, and the voice of guest, and we'll go from there. Anyways, let me run the social media contact, and then we will, or the social media audio clip, and then I'll come back, and we'll hit the topic of choice for this episode. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Now this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about the myths and truths of campus carry. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. It's, you're hearing, well, you don't really need uh, these teenagers carrying guns on college campuses, except teenagers really aren't going to get to carry guns on comp- on college campuses. You're hearing things like, uh, it'll cost a lot of money. Well, actually, it shouldn't. And we're going to discuss all that. But you know what? Let's start it off with talking about the requirements for being able to carry. First off, you have to be 21 years of age. Now, there is an exception for military members and those who have received an honorable discharge. But you don't see that many of them uh, carrying a gun. Mostly because if they're 18 and they're in the military, well, if they're 18 and they're in the military, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. But if they're 18 and they're in the military, they typically are not going to be going to college. And if they get an honorable discharge from the military, it's usually under medical circumstances and they're going to be doing a lot of rehabilitation before they go to college. So you have a small subset of people that will be carrying on campus. And if any of them are below 21, it'll be a surprise. Now, in order to be able to get a concealed handgun license, which you would have to have to carry on this college campus in Texas if this bill passes, you could not have a Class A or a Class B misdemeanor conviction in the last five years. You've also, in order to get that CHL license, you'd also have to get a background check by the FBI. You cannot owe taxes to the state of Texas. You cannot be chemically dependent. That comes back in a little bit. We're going to touch on that one again in a moment. 
You cannot be under a protective order. You cannot be of unsound mind. And you must receive training on Texas defensive laws if you have a Texas concealed handgun license. But let's go back to the one where you cannot be chemically dependent. In order to be able to say you're not chemically dependent, you cannot be an alcoholic. And a lot of college students cannot say that. A lot of college students go there so they can become alcoholics, and they do a pretty uh, poor job of being a very sociable person, so they could not get a concealed handgun license. And we're going to move on from there into the actual drinking and campus carry. Most drinking takes place off campus where campus carry changes nothing. In other words, if somebody's already got a concealed handgun license and they're going to be at a college party where there's drinking, odds are it's off campus. I don't know of any campus that says, okay, you can legally or we're going to give you permission to consume alcoholic beverages in this educational environment that we have crafted so that you can learn. I'm sorry, but they really don't do that. Or if they do, then that campus probably has more problems than uh, anything that campus carry would be influencing. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. Now, it also is a crime right now to be intoxicated and carry a licensed handgun. That means that if you're going to carry a concealed handgun, you already know it's illegal to be intoxicated and carry. Why do you already know that? Because you've got the Texas defensive uh the training on the Texas defensive laws and the concealed carry class. But then there's the claim cost and all that for carriage or for the college on the campus carry bill. Some people are saying, well, it's going to cost a lot of money to be able to store these guns. Why? If somebody's bringing their gun to college and they're going to be storing it in there, they have to have some kind of a system to protect that gun when they're not around it. That means you can easily write it in if they're going to be in the dorms You can write it in where if they have a concealed handgun license and they're bringing the concealed handgun onto campus and they're going to store it in their dorm, they have to provide some kind of, well, they have to provide some kind of mechanism where they can store the gun in a safe and secure manner. And the college has every bit of the authority to do that under this bill. They're also claiming that the police will require additional training. And I apologize if you heard that, but that was a notification that I need to kind of silence. However, they're claiming that the campus police are going to require additional training in order to be able to deal with campus carry. And I'm wondering exactly what kind of uh, training they're going to require. I mean, consider this. You have police officers that are off campus already dealing with concealed carry. They already know how to identify good guys from bad guys when they approach a scene of a shooting. They know how to, I mean, they know, basically they have all this training already if they're a law enforcement officer off campus. And to be a law enforcement officer on campus, you have to meet the same requirements for off-campus duty. And unless these people are hiring people that are not qualified to do the job by law, they do not meet the legal requirements for the job, then these people already have the training to do it. There should be no retraining for campus police. They may have to issue a bulletin saying, okay, here's your reminder. This has become law. Do not try try to arrest somebody if you learn they have a concealed handgun. They may have to do that but these officers already know how to deal with it, at least if they're properly certified, they do. And then there's the actual cost. Now, the University of Texas at Austin, I believe I got this information. I want to say it was them, and I want to believe I got this from concealedcampus.org. But one of the colleges, and I believe it was UT at Austin, actually, uh, they actually said the cost of the campus carry bill would be zero. That's interesting, especially when you consider the UT the University of Texas system is saying they have to have this huge amount of money in order to do all this preparation for it. I'm sorry, but that makes no sense. Now, another argument that's made is that the college campuses are actually quite safe and there's no need to conceal carry on them. But let me point something out real quick. Universities are often accused of cooking the books to make them look safer. After all, Nobody wants to send their daughter to a college where rape is a everyday occurrence or a weekly occurrence or a monthly occurrence. Somebody doesn't want to send their daughter where it's a regular thing that happens. Now, when you think about that, that makes sense that they might be tempted to cook their books. I'm not saying they do, but they have been accused of it in the past, and these accusations come forward on a regular basis. Now, when I say they cook their books, let me... Let me clarify that a little bit more. Sometimes they find loopholes to reclassify a sexual assault as, say, a misdemeanor assault. 
Sometimes they find loopholes to qual- to classify armed robbery as, I don't know, extortion. And then suddenly these these violent crimes don't get reported as violent crimes. You see this in some cities. Now, the following statistics that I want to quote to you are for 2012, and they each come from the from the university's own Cleary reports, for their main campus, no less. And 2012 was the most recent I could find for all three campuses in the short notice I had for doing this episode. Now, the largest campus is less than 10 square miles or less than one half the size of Friendswood, Texas. For those of you who don't know, Friendswood, Texas is about 20 square miles and it's located not far from Houston. Keep in mind that if a university is actually cooking their books and making their reports look like they're safer than they really are, then their numbers are going to be quite a bit higher than what I'm actually going to quote in the following. Now, if their reports are accurate, then you'll be in pretty good shape. But let's take a look at Friendswood, Texas, and what they what they had for, I believe it was, actually it was 2012, because I got their stats for the same year as the campuses. In 2012, Friendswood, Texas had four rapes, four robberies. It doesn't, the stats I found did not say if they were armed robberies or just simply robberies. And they had seven total assaults. It doesn't say if they were aggravated or otherwise. Now, the stats for the campuses, when I say robberies, it doesn't say if they're armed robberies or if they're something else. It just says robberies. But they do specify aggravated assaults. As a result, the information for the campuses are going to be aggravated assaults. It's not going to be simple assaults that are, that are not aggravated. And basically, this will inflate Friendswood, Texas, on their total assaults instead of uh, reporting just aggravated assaults. Also, for Friendswood, I had no information on the illegal weapon possession arrest. So let's take a look at uh, the Texas A&M campus, their main campus. In 2012, they had six forcible sex offenses. This would be rape. They had two robberies, three aggravated assaults, and three illegal weapons possession arrests. An additional two arrests for illegal, or additional two instances of illegal weapons possession were referred for disciplinary action. Basically, they had six more rapes than a town twice the size of their campus. And we're talking actual area. We're not talking about population. I think if we looked at population, the campus would probably be a bit higher. But they had six forcible sex offenses where friends would had four rapes. And I think rapes would count as forcible sex offense. In fact, they're pretty much indistinguishable. They had half the robberies of friends would, which would make sense. And they had about half the aggravated assaults that friends would had total assaults. And you have to remember, aggravated assaults constitute a very small portion of regular ass- of overall assaults. And then we'll go to something that's a little closer to home for me with Texas Tech. Texas Tech had five forcible sex offenses. That means they were one more than Friendswood and one less than A&M. They had one robbery, which is pretty good. They had four aggravated assaults, which is about in line with Friendswood, based on assuming they're half the size. Although I think Tech's uh, home campus is actually the smallest of the three. I want to say Tech's campus is about 3.8 miles or 3.1 miles. That's square miles, where Friendswood is 20 square miles. When you consider that, these numbers get scary big. And they had four illegal weapons possession arrests. And and this is where Tech really shines. They had an additional 17 illegal weapons possession uh, cases that were referred for disciplinary action. They had more referred for disciplinary action than A&M had arrest and disciplinary actions combined and tripled. That's right. If you combine A&Ms, that gives you a total of five, and you triple it, and it's still not as many as Tech. And then in 2012, the University of Texas, this is the one in Austin, had nine forcible sex offenses. They had nearly twice as many rapes, or, yeah, as friends with Texas. They had two robberies. They had two aggravated assaults. They had one illegal weapons possession arrest, and they had no additional cases that were referred for disciplinary action. Now let's think about this. A&M is, I want to say A&M is 8.1 square miles. And the UT is between A&M and Tech in size on the main campus. A&M 
had more rapes than Friendswood. Now, don't get me wrong. Friendswood is a very safe city. But you got to understand, when you have a college campus having this many forcible sex offenses, you have a problem. It's not safe. And these are only the ones that were reported. These are not the ones that were, she, you know, she got beat up, she was raped, and then she didn't report it because she didn't want to go through the through being made a victim again in the court system. Or she was discouraged by somebody from reporting it because it could harm her academic career. Or she was discouraged from reporting it because it might harm his academic career, which is one of the reasons campus, college campus police tend to try and discourage reporting on these, supposedly. But you have these instances. You have, a, you have motivation for campuses to under-report crimes or discourage them from being filed and, or reported. And you have these numbers that are much higher than, some, than a city that's twice the size of the campus. Yeah, there's something wrong, especially when that city is right there in the... I mean, it's a suburb of Houston. So while it may be a safe city, the city's, it's not going to be a it's, it's not going to be a lightly populated city. It's going to be well populated. But let's take a look at you know I don't even want to go there. I'm getting sick and tired of actually looking at numbers and statistics on this. College campuses are not safe. Let's make that perfectly clear. If you're going to college and you're doing so to be safe, I'm sorry you're deluding yourself. And I'm not. And when I'm in these statistics, I'm giving you. They're for on-campus crimes. They're not for off-campus, but on-school property crimes. They're not for off-campus crimes that happen to students that get reported as on-campus crimes. This is stuff that's happening inside the main campus boundaries. This is not these statistics that I'm, these numbers I'm giving you, they're coming from the campus themselves. My county, that's right, my county has had fewer forcible sex offenses in 2012 than these three campuses. I don't know. Just looking at this, this does not make sense. It doesn't. But you know what? Let's move on to something that somebody sent me. And uh, they sent me this thing about if it wasn't for Open Carry Texas, Campus Carry wouldn't be where it's at. Well, we're going to approach something that somebody posted to Facebook. This somebody would be C.J. Grisham, the leader of Open Carry Texas. He posted to Facebook, for the first time in Texas history, a campus bill was also passed out of committee. You pass campus bills out of committee? Is that like passing gas? When a bill gets out of committee, it's reported favorably. It's not passed. But let's look at the validity of the whole idea that this is the first time in Texas history a campus carry bill has gotten out of committee. It's not. And it's not the and it's not because of open carry Texas supporting it either. In two thousand and nine, House Bill one thousand eight hundred ninety three was reported favorably out of committee. You know what the topic of that one was? Campus carry. In 2011, House Bill 750, once again, campus carry, was reported favorably out of committee. In 2013, House Bill 972, once again, that's campus carry, was reported favorably out of committee. In fact, 2013 actually made it, uh, House Bill 972 actually made it to the Senate. It got passed out of Senate, out of the Senate committee, and then it died on the intent calendar because time ran out. 2013 was the closest we got to having campus carry. I'm sorry, but uh, the whole statement that this is the first time in Texas history a campus carry bill got out of committee? No, it's not. It's not uh, the first time that somebody can say that campus carry's made it out this far. It's not. It's made it further in the past. But let's talk about some bills that have... We're going to do a little bit of a Texas legislative update now instead of later. We're going to talk about these bills that have been filed recently. And let's kick it off to uh, let's kick it off with House Bill 2194 or 2190. I don't know where I got 2194. I don't even know what that bill's about. House Bill 2190 is similar to SB 258, and like SB 258, it is intended to force background checks for all firearm sales at or around gun shows. Oh man, this whole gun show loophole. We gotta get private sales uh, background checked. Yada yada. No, we don't. Now, this bill has confusing and ambiguous language. As a result, it is a threat to gun rights. Some people will say, well, this bill really doesn't do anything because it requires it has that the background check be done as required by federal law. And federal law doesn't require it, so it doesn't have to be done. Yeah, that's the ambiguous part. 
it does say a background check is to be done, but it has to be done pursuant to federal law. So does it mean it has to be done, even though federal law says it doesn't have to be, or it has to be done, but not really because federal law says it doesn't have to be? That's the ambiguity of the situation, and, you know, it's not good. This is the kind of bill that uh, they go back and they correct it later and they make it a far more they make it far more nasty than it is now, and we have to deal with an even nastier version later. And then there's House Bill 2823. This bill relates to prohibiting certain physician questions regarding firearms. With current health care requirements placed upon doctors, this bill will prevent doctors from asking questions that could become a permanent note in the patient's records. Now, I personally feel that this is a very necessary protection for Second Amendment rights. This bill has the unfortunate side effect of a minimal restriction on a doctor's First Amendment rights while performing his duties. However, it is a protection against using the medical profession to basically create a registry of gun owners. Now, the question is, should a doctor be asking you questions to put in your medical record about things that have no bearing on your treatment? The answer is no. Now, if you and him are discussing it, you know, as a friendly little banter, you know, because he likes to go hunting, you like to go hunting, and you know he likes to go hunting because either he mentioned it or he's got European mounts in his office or who knows. Let's say you figured it out and you brought it up or he says, well, I won't be available next week because I'm going to be out of town going to Colorado to hunt XYZ. And then you bring up that you're a hunter too or you're a gun owner and that he really needs to be a member of the NRA. Who cares? As long as it's not part of his questionnaire or it's not part of his routine questions that he's going to put on file in your medical records that are stored with the federal government, who cares? If it's going to be stored in your medical record, then yes, this does not need to be asked. It does not, it's none of his business. And then we have House Bill 2918. This bill creates a buffer zone around public officials of 25 feet where ordinary citizens are prohibited from recording these officials, unless that person is carrying a handgun under the authority of a concealed handgun license, in which case it becomes 100 feet. Exceptions to portions of this bill are made for certain people like, I don't know, uh, news and media personnel or people working with or for the police department. Basically, this particular bill it's being filed in response to Corey Watkins and his open carry cop watch or open carry cop block activities. And I'll be honest, people will, you know, people will say, oh, that's not really the case because Corey Watkins doesn't have a CHL. No, he doesn't. But I'm not too sure that the CHL thing is aimed at him or if it's aimed at people in his group that they, you know, people feel a lot of his group has a concealed handgun license. A lot of people in it, they, you know, a lot of people feel that they do, but we don't know how many people in open carry Tarrant County or in this little cop block, cop watch thing, we don't know how many of them have a concealed handgun license. But I think that this bill is actually aimed, the way it's worded, it's written this way in case open carry becomes legal as a licensed open carry bill. But it's aimed strictly at Corey Watkins because it's filed by, well, the, its author is from Dallas. For those of you who don't know, Dallas is right next door to Arlington. There may be a few small little communities between them, but they're, you know, they're right there together. And you also have to keep in mind that a lot of times these politicians will file a bill and then they'll allow it to be amended as part of the negotiation process where, say, instead of a CHL, it's unlicensed carry. Well, instead of require, we'll change it so that if somebody's carrying a firearm, they and they're within 100 feet, then it's a Class A misdemeanor unless they have a CHL. And that may be a negotiation point he uses to try and get the bill passed. Who knows? But this is a bad bill. HB 2190 is a bad bill. They both need to be, they both need to be killed in committee. House Bill 2823 is a good bill. It needs to progress and be passed into law. And I apologize. Uh, I'm trying to do this with a sore throat. And I've probably drank three bottles of water while I'm doing this episode. So please excuse me if I, if I sound a little coarse or if I, if I sound distracted, it's because I'm drinking a lot of water right now. I'm just trying to keep myself hydrated, at least keep everything manageable where I don't lose my voice while I'm doing this episode. Now, with that in mind, let me just go ahead and run the contact information past you. And then 
We'll come back to the news and wrap the podcast up. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. All right, folks, and we're back. My sinuses included. I do not like this mess. Uh, the reason my the reason I'm so dry right now is because I my sinuses are acting up. I've taken medication, and the medication's drying me up. On top of that, my sinuses are completely plugged, and I'm doing my best not to sound like Darth Vader on the on this podcast. Now then, let's move on to the news. We got two news articles that are in the politics category, and one in the miscellaneous category. And the miscellaneous is a feel good story, at least from my opinion. Our first news article has the headline of gun control activists fight to be heard at the Capitol or at Capitol. And some might say it illustrates how unpopular the position of the activist is with the legislators or and possibly their constituents. However, the truth of the matter is that Julie Gar- Gavrin, I apologize. I think it's Julie Gavrin. If I mispronounced her name, I offer my apologies for that and that alone. Anyways, Julie represents the group campaign to keep guns off campus. Somebody might want to let her know that as long as they don't go into the buildings, they can already go on campus. Anyways, though, Julie was told by a staffer who did not know better that there would not be any invited testimony on SB 11 and SB 17. The article goes on. It says there's nobody there opposing the bills. And in a way, there was, at least in the invited testimony, I'm not sure about. But And I kind of scanned the article. I had a whole different podcast written out, and then I deleted the show notes. So I had to go back in a rush and recreate them. Now, Lucy and Dave wrote in. They saved me a lot of trouble coming up with uh, more news articles that I had, but I no longer had because I deleted it. But Lucy and Dave wrote in and saved the day to say that Open Carry Texas has announced their second annual hike that started it all on March 16th. Now, that will be probably the day after this podcast episode is released. Now, the name of the event up imply, and this is, I want to read this like uh, Julia, or not Julia, like Lucy and Dave wrote, wrote it. The name of the event implies that this hike started Open Carry Texas, not the Open Carry Movement. The article, based on the press release, claims the only person convicted of lawful open carry in, was in Bell County. The truth of the matter is that the conviction was not for open carry, but for interfering with the duties of a public servant, which stems from him resisting the officer who tried to disarm him without warning. And I'm going to expand on that. Anybody that's watched that video, both from the police officer's uh, dash cam and from CJ Grisham's cell phone, they can tell you right now that everybody involved was not at their peak as far as being a polite individual. Things were confrontational from the beginning. However, if somebody reaches in and grabs a weapon without telling you, especially when you've received weapons retention training, your first reaction is to resist. Now, with that in mind, let me say that I agree that C.J. Grisham should not have been convicted on that particular charge. There's a lot of things I, I could think of him being convicted for, like being rude, being dishonest. But, you know, the whole thing about the, I mean, this art, the press release that this article is based on, it says he was convicted of lawful open carry. That's not the case. That's dishonesty. That's his group that's doing it. He's the leader of the group. He is accountable for that. But his arrest and his conviction for interfering with the duties of a public servant? No. In all honesty, everybody should have apologized to everybody else, and he should have been allowed to continue on his way with his son. And everybody should have gone home with a bad taste in their mouth on that incident. He should not have been arrested. He should not have been charged and had the charges changed to fit something that they could finally convict him on. And he should not have been convicted on what they convicted him of. And then we have the story where, and this is in our miscellaneous category, but we have a story where it makes me feel good. A Texas man had his rifle returned to him by the Drug Enforcement Agency, a.k.a. DEA, we recovered it along with other firearms in a drug raid in 2013. What is truly amazing is that 24 years after it was stolen, and this is when it was returned, it was 24 years later, the owner gave the rifle to his son just as he had intended to do all along. 
You see, the idea was his son, I believe, was six at the time. And the idea he had was he's going to take the gun and when his son got old enough, give it to his son. But the gun was stolen before he could do that. He got it back and then he went ahead and gave it to his son. That is an awesome, heartwarming story. I like it. I like it a lot. Well, let me say that with this episode, I'm going to call it wrapped up. We're going to process it, get it ready to be uploaded and release it on schedule for Sunday morning. And by Sunday morning, I mean like around midnight. With that said, stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.